So welcome to our uh, Open Edu uh, Summer Camp Series. Um, this is an ongoing free and open education series on environmental justice and uh, human rights centering uh, instructors and perspectives of the global majority. Uh, my name is Candace Fortin, um, originally from Pensacola, Florida, currently residing in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn. Uh, I am a daughter of Haitian refugees and uh, have a global perspective and background as well. Um, but I'm really happy to be here. I'm a new team member with the Open Edu Summer Camp and the uh, Open Edu Series in general. Uh, and just really happy to meet all of you and continue to build. Um, so as a nonprofit organization, uh, we depend on the support of, of all of you to support uh, sustain this program and to keep it free. Uh, so we thank each and every one of you have donated and have shared our work, whether it's online or, um, you know, just doing a quick uh, drop of five, ten dollars on um, our fundraising efforts. Um, and please note that our work is under uh, Creative Commons, uh, which is an open license that allows for content to be shared, remixed and built upon. Uh, since open education is under CC by non-commercial, uh, feel free to build upon our work by stating your sources and attributing the original work. I uh, just want to give a shout out as well to everyone who did donate to our super funds for donations for in support of Lebanon. Um, thank you all. We really exponentially went way past our goal. Um, and that was from the actions that you guys took from online. Um, so thank you all so much for that work. Um, and now I'm going to pass it on to Liz Ricketts, who is going to teach us about the history of resale markets and throwing away clothes for a living. Uh, Liz Ricketts is a designer and founder of the Ore Foundation, uh, which guides us through where our surplus goods go, how they affect the planet, and uh, what alternatives to this existing model are. So Liz, I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so hi everyone, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. And I definitely want to thank the whole team at Slow Factory. Thanks Candace for the lovely introduction and for Nicole for coordinating all of this to Vestier for supporting. And also thanks to Aja and Celine for her, um, your classes. Hopefully you attended those. And if you didn't, I definitely encourage you to review them. Um, so again, as Candace said, my name is Liz Ricketts. I'm the co-founder of the Ore Foundation, and we're a not-for-profit that's based both in the United States and Ghana. We've been working between the two countries since 2009 and working in solidarity with the continent of the second-hand clothing market in Accra, Ghana since 2016. And again, as Candace mentioned, you'll be hearing from some of our friends and colleagues, both from Ghana and from Uganda, and they'll be able to join us for the Q&A so you can interact with them directly. So the history of resale, it's becoming big business here in the United States, resale. What does that mean? What does that mean for you, for fashion, for the environment? Is thrift being gentrified? Is the secondhand clothing trade an extension of colonialism? I will attempt to address these questions by laying bare the ways that the secondhand clothing trade has shaped relations between the global North and the global South. Because I'm from the United States and I work in Ghana, I will be keeping most of my commentary specific to these two countries, but the themes do apply more broadly. The first section is resistance. I want to begin with honoring the life of Kobena Seichi, who was born in 1891 to an upper class aristocratic family in Cape Coast, which at the time was part of the Gold Coast colony, today known as the country of Ghana. According to his own accounts, Seichi was raised to believe that European culture was superior to his own. He was raised to believe that wearing a suit made him powerful and signaled his sure path to success. All of this would change in his 20, when, 20s when Seichi's uncle sent him to study law in England. The ship he was on was torpedoed by a German submarine and 104 lives were lost. When the rescue team was wading through the wreckage looking for survivors, the white sailors refused to pick him up or to offer him a life jacket. And he had checked all the boxes, played by the rules, done the things they said he needed to do, and yet it didn't much matter in the end. This event changed his outlook completely. He would no longer pay, play by the oppressor's rules, and one of the first things he did was to rebel against the oppressor's dress code. He vowed never to wear European clothing again and became the first lawyer in the colony to wear traditional African cloth in court. Seichi did more than lose a suit. He wrote plays encouraging people to rebel against European culture and embrace local traditions. He became a leading Pan-African theorist 
and although he died one year before it happened, his contributions to the Constitutional Committee and his push to boycott European imports was absolutely crucial to Ghana's independence in 1957. Now, fast forward to today. This is an image from January of 2020. This is excess secondhand clothing washed ashore on one of Accra's central beaches. Kansamanto Market in Accra, Ghana is the largest secondhand clothing market in West Africa and probably the largest in the world. It sees 15 million garments a week in a country of 30 million people. Much of it ends up like this. During the transatlantic traffic in enslaved Africans, Ghana's coast became the largest port of exit for human beings who were transported to what is today the United States. And today, Ghana is one of the largest ports of entry for used stuff from the United States, Canada, UK, and many other countries. This includes used clothing. Ghana is the second largest importer of used clothing in the world. Seichi refused to comply with the very dress codes that produce the excess that now floods the coast he called home. The rest of this presentation will explore what happened. So I also want to begin with Kobena Sechi because I want to emphasize that while the global north is now framing buying used or secondhand clothing as a form of resistance and revolution, a way to revolt against fast fashion and consumerism, and while I wholeheartedly believe that we should be choosing secondhand over new, it is also very important for those of us from the global north to recognize that there are and have been many communities in the global south doing all they can to resist the cultural imperialism imposed upon them by this very same thing, used clothing. Changing the locks. This title comes from the idea that those in power may give people the keys, but they can just as easily change the locks. This is the way that I think about what accessibility looks like under neoliberalism and neocolonialism. Fashion marketing being a very good tool for changing the locks without people noticing. So when I say secondhand clothing, what comes to mind? You might think of secondhand as charity, as recycling, or even as waste management. But first and foremost, secondhand is a supply chain. It is a primary supply chain for over half of the global population. And it always has been. For all of human history, the clothing that filled people's closets did not begin its life with them. Because until recently, clothing was considered not only a durable good, but a luxury one at that. Now, much of the resale history has gone undocumented because A, it was normal, and B, most resale markets operated in what we call the informal economy, person-to-person -person commerce. But just because it was informal does not mean it was unstructured. By the Middle Ages, there were recognized guilds across Europe and, the, and that organized the collection of youth clothing, they repaired, upcycled, and revalued secondhand clothes by public markets and door to door distribution. Secondhand markets became more abundant throughout Europe and the United States during early industrialization leading up to the 1850s. Mass production had not yet reached the scale of the population, and everyone, regardless of class, was drawn to the wider variety of materials and styles available through retail markets. By the late 1800s, these markets would be, would be referred to as flea markets. And it's important to note that during this time, repair and upcycling were common and expected. Little changed until the 1850s when industrial production ramped up and the general public was suddenly able to access new ready-to-wear garments. Secondhand markets were very um, necessary, however, because new garments required real investment. In her class two weeks ago, Aja highlighted the triangle shirtwaist fire. I want to draw our attention to the fact that most garment workers at the time including those who were killed in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, were unable to afford the clothing they were manufacturing. The women working there earned around $6 a week in 1911. After paying for expenses like rent, food, and entertainment, like attending a dance, these women would be left with less than 40 cents a week of what we now call disposable income. The average full outfit at the time cost $10, meaning that it would take them a minimum of 25 weeks or nearly half a year to save up enough money to buy one new outfit. Garment workers would rely primarily on resale markets, swaps, and hand-me-downs to get dressed for their factory jobs. The same was true for most immigrant communities who relied on resale markets not only as a way to participate in consumerism, but also as a way to connect with community. Meanwhile, colonialism. The colonial frontier demands compliance. That is how it dominates. And dress codes play a big role here. 
The British utilized both education and religion to demean local dress as primitive, traditional, and even as evil. The colonial oppressors set up schools to mirror the British boarding school system. This included the uniforms. So those with educational privilege would be required to wear khakis, ties, white shirts, blazers, that sort of thing. Meanwhile, I've seen many primary school books that were given to less privileged schools in rural environments that explicitly lay out all the reasons why people should be ashamed of their indigenous dress. The programming was coming from the top down and the bottom up. Western style dress was seen as modest, whereas local cloth was literally considered the devil's clothes. As you can see in this quote about a teacher who dared preach in his indigenous attire. Of course, the real gag here is that complying with dress codes was expensive. I read several accounts where teachers saved up for three or more years before they could order a suit from London. So not only did the colonizer undermine local culture in the name of morality, but it was also very happy to take Donnegan's money in that process. The British also made sure to control who had access through various means, including setting strict pricing on imported clothing and oftentimes making sure that locals did not have access to the latest trends, but rather would receive hand-me-downs or were invited to buy from last season's catalog. And oftentimes, these hand-me-downs were considered compensation. Even when the British did get about clothing, they would alter it in some way to differentiate between themselves and locals. With suits, they cut the sleeves short in an attempt to demean the wearer. But my friends Molly and Molly explained to me that this did not work because it became a look, a popular style of its own and a political statement of resistance. The most violent perhaps is the way that the British stoked regional divides. People living in Northern Ghana were not as quick to convert to Christianity. So the British intentionally stopped the circulation of Western style dress and books to create a divide between regions between those who obey and those who do not. So let's pause here because we often hear that secondhand clothing is only exported to countries where there is a demand for it. Considering this history that I've just laid out, who demands what of whom? Colonialism demands compliance. In this way, colonialism creates the conditions for conformity. Navigating oppressive dress codes is not an expression of demand by the oppressed. Kwame Nkrumah. Ghana's first president and a pan-African visionary who planned to unite the African continent and who coined the term neocolonialism and who I think is long overdue for a Netflix special. Now Kwame Nkrumah knew how to use clothing. As he worked towards independence, Nkrumah imported many bespoke suits from London to Accra. But on the night that he declared independence, Nkrumah and the other independence leaders wore Batakari tops a cotton smock originally hand-woven and sewn in Northern Ghana, the same region that the British had denied access to Western style dress. His choice sent a message of resistance against the old and a message of unity in the way forward. In this photo of Nkrumah dancing with the Duchess of Kent, he wears a hand-woven golden orange cloth with a design that denotes forgiveness and tolerance of the quote-unquote one who strays into your path a little side-eye to the former oppressor. In his time as president, Nkrumah swapped between local and foreign-made clothing. He continued to order suits from London, but on the other hand, he invested heavily in Ghana's textile industry. Nkrumah may have resented colonial dress codes, but he also seemed to believe that there was power in taking ownership of them. He understood that clothing was a tool and what mattered was how you used it. He did not believe that Ghanaians should be confined to what the global North considered traditional or modern, and he championed the agency of Ghanaians to mix local and foreign garments. Following Nkrumah's lead, the style of post-independence Ghana was very much a blending of local and foreign, but foreign interests were also very eager to present themselves as local, because at the very same time as the British and other European parties were selling hand-me-downs they were also stealing the designs of local textile manufacturers and appropriating Ghanaian culture in an attempt to undercut the development of local industry. This is why many of the textiles that people refer to as African prints are actually 100% foreign made and foreign benefiting. At this time, more secondhand clothing was beginning to come into the country from the global north, especially from the United States. And yet most Ghanaians still prioritize locally made textiles and fashion for special events. Western style dress was useful, 
but locally made clothing with culture. And importantly, during this time, Ghanaians kept garments for a lifetime, repairing, mending, resizing, passing on, and repurposing both local and secondhand goods. It may not have been perfect, but for a few years, they seemed to be balanced. This would soon change, however. In 1983, just 17 years after Nkrumah was overthrown by the CIA, Ghana would undergo what is called structural adjustment. To break the yoke of colonialism, former colonies such as Ghana supported their industries and arts programming with government spending, often creating businesses that were wholly or partly owned by the government. This practice became ensnared in the Cold War socialist versus capitalist dynamics of the time. And beyond that, it meant that because many industries, including Ghana's textile industry, as well as many social and educational programs, were so heavily subsidized by the government, in many cases, they were detached from market mechanisms. At least that was the argument from the economists in the global north, writing in support of free market enterprise in the 1980s. When Ghana's government needed cash to stay afloat and to buy the goods they needed on the international market with their currency, they turned to the World Bank and IMF for loans. Structural adjustment was the term for the leverage that the World Bank group employed on low-income, recently independent governments looking for financial support. The idea was that the World Bank would lend money, but only on the condition that governments privatize previously nationalized businesses and services, and that governments basically scrap support for anything that the World Bank did not deem essential, such as art and music. Basically, it was a lever for neocolonialism to take root. The stated intention of the World Bank was, of course, to reduce poverty and indebtedness, but the opposite very much happened. For one, although Ghanaians experienced a minimum wage increase, after a few years, this meant nothing due to the rise in food prices and the fact that citizens now had to pay high fees for basic necessities like water and healthcare. Loan money intentionally flowed to infrastructure projects focused on moving raw resources out of the country, not to infrastructure projects that fostered trade within the country or across the continent. Loan money for developing agriculture ended up going mainly to cocoa and export and not to other crops. On the other, or on top of this, Ghana was required to cut back on public sector employment, including in healthcare. In the first decade after structural adjustments, 200,000 Ghanaians lost their jobs in the public sector. This also impacted the local textile and fashion industry. For the most part, loan money did not go to the textile sector. Employment within Ghana's textile sector declined from a high of 25,000 in 1975 to 5,000 jobs in the year 2000, and even less today. The number of large manufacturers has declined from 16 to three. More secondhand clothing began flooding into Ghana because locally made textiles and garments were no longer running at capacity. Many of the elders we know who worked in Contamanzo 30, 40 years ago, they lost high paying jobs at this time. They were mechanical engineers at textile firms, healthcare professionals, and public sector employees. Without many other options, many of these people found a way to survive by selling secondhand goods. Meanwhile, the Global North is pumping out more clothing than ever before, and that clothing will need somewhere to go. The 1950s and 60s saw the rise of mass-produced fashion in the United States, spurred on by new man-made materials such as polyester. Disposability was marketed to United States citizens as convenient, targeting the housewife who, regardless of whether she had a job outside of the house or not, was busy performing unpaid labor around the house and needed to free up some time. Instead of paying people for care work, we offered them easy breezy disposable plastic, Tupperware, disposable diapers, and plastic clothing that doesn't wrinkle as easily. Convenience is the backbone of the linear or disposable economy. Aja and Celine spoke extensively about the history of fast fashion and disposability culture, so definitely watch their classes for more detail on this. And as Celine explains in her class, from the 1960s to now, progress has been defined by newness, comfort, ease, convenience, et cetera. Consumerism has made us numb to what we really want and what we really need. Consumerism has led us to produce a whole lot of extra stuff. Global garment production is over 100 billion garments a year. Zara was once considered fast fashion, but there are now ultra fast fashion and real-time fast fashion companies 
spitting out new clothing every second of every day. Most middle and upper class folks in the global north simply have too much clothing, wearing only 20% of our closet. All of this adds up to a lot of clothing being landfilled. Globally, one garbage truck of textiles is landfilled or incinerated every second, according to the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. But I also want to emphasize the domination of fast fashion brands. We just talked about how colonialism demands compliance, which leads to conformity, which leads to homogeneity. Globalization has largely been a homogenizing force, which is very good for companies like H&M. Because if we are all convinced to want the same thing, to aspire to the same culture, then it is much easier for companies to expand and extract more profit from more parts of the world, turning the world into one big corporate colony. While fast fashion is accelerating, the informal secondhand trade is being formalized, which is another way of saying that it is being gentrified, commercialized, or modernized. This is the first time in history where a middle-class consumer can choose between used and new. For them, buying used becomes all about the context in which they buy it. This is when the difference between antiques, vintage, thrift, and secondhand become very blurry. <laughs> I used to work in both the vintage market and a flea market in New York City. And the first people to line up at 9 a.m. on Saturday to pick over the flea market were none other than the vintage dealers. Secondhand had always involved some rehabilitation, upcycling, and a lot of bargaining, of course. But now it was all about the flip. Secondhand became embroiled in our consumerist culture, and many communities were left behind. The flea market I worked at is now closed. The swap meets that many antique dealers source from were raided by immigration authorities and shut down for selling counterfeit goods. And at the same time, rich people were getting in on the game for the novelty of it, with folks like Martha Stewart advising the wealthy on how to blend in and look authentic at the flea market. Now, operating underneath all of these developments in the 20th century resale world lies the charity shop. Charities like Salvation Army and Goodwill have been around for over 100 years, and personally, I think the charities like Salvation Army and Goodwill do a lot of good work. But the premise of secondhand charity is something that we really need to think long and hard about. In a consumer-centric culture, everything becomes mediated by commerce, including community service. The mottos of charities like Goodwill and Salvation Army speak to the bootstrap mentality of the United States. Shop Goodwill and help people earn jobs is one motto. Another one is a leg up, not a handout. This is where it becomes very important for us to think of secondhand as a supply chain. Who is performing the labor within the secondhand economy and who is profiting from it? According to Goodwill, one out of every 600 people who go to work in the United States do so with the help of Goodwill. But at the same time, both Salvation Army and Goodwill are known for underpaying workers. Salvation Army uses what is called quote unquote work therapy, where people going through rehab work 40 hours a week sorting donations, operating heavy machinery, cleaning and cooking, all without being paid anything. They can also apply for special certificates to pay quote unquote lower performing workers far less than minimum wage. All while the CEOs make around 500K a year. Again, these organizations sell clothes to fund mission work, but even if they put profits to good use in our communities, we need to rethink the labor that exists within the resale industry, both in the United States and abroad. And we also need to stop acting as if donating our t-shirts will save the planet. The truth is that most of us donate the old so that we can make room for the new. Because of this, charity shops in the global north can only sell 10 to 20% of what they collect locally. The rest of it will enter the global secondhand clothing trade. When you donate clothing, the higher value items known as the vintage or the cream, those get skimmed off the top and sold in the global north, while the lower value garments, things like single use t-shirts, those get exported to countries like Ghana. Single use t-shirts make up around 25% of every shipping container that enters Consumato, and no one in Ghana wants these t-shirts. And judging by the rate that people donate t-shirts, most people in the United States don't want them either. The truth is that we have clogged up the resale system with a lot of crap. One man's trash is most often not another man's treasure. It's just trash. And all this trash, it has to go somewhere or else we would be so overwhelmed by the clothing that is sitting around all of us that we would stop shopping. 
As early as the 1950s, the secondhand clothing economy has been a for-profit venture born of the global north excess. This was marketed as charity for our convenience and our comfort, because a guilt-free outlet for the old is necessary to push the new. Now, before we delve back into what this means for Ghana, I want to highlight the fact that secondhand clothing is often exported to major cotton growing and garment producing countries, such as Uganda, Honduras, and Cambodia. Because garment workers are exploited and still do not earn a living wage, most garment workers cannot afford the garments that they make. Many garment workers around the world rely on secondhand clothing to clothe themselves and their families. Now, when secondhand clothing was first exported to Ghana, it was called Obruni Wawu, or dead white man's clothes. It was called this because the clothing looked nearly new, and there was so much of it. People assumed that the clothing must be coming from dead foreigners. Of course, people soon realized that this was not true, but in the name, or but this name is very important because it reminds us that the very concept of excess was not indigenous. Excess is something that has to be taught and something that has been taught to all of us. To end this section, I want to share an important message from my friend Molly, who will reflect on what has been lost in the name of secondhand clothing. Greetings, I'm Danny Molly Quist, a stylist, maker, designer, curator, entrepreneur, and the owner of um, the 45 Lifestyle Space here in Accra. The specific second-hand garment that I think represents the globalization of Ghana dress, called Ghana dress or culture, is the suit. The suit, in the sense that, look, we as a continent or as Ghana, we all we wrapped and draped in our fabrics. The aesthetic, or um, was in the weave than it was in the style of the garment. And so the suit created the class, classism and the, the, the separation that we have um, as a people. So it's one single garment that I can blame a lot of things on because of its history. Um, men and women from here used to wrap cloth and drape in cloth and create very similar styles of um, of um, of attire, you know. But the suit created classism and also, you know, made that gap and created like made like patriarchy like a big, 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 big thing. What aspect of Ghanaian dress style, fashion culture do? I consider more sustainable than buying and wearing secondhand. That's exactly it. Making and sewing our own garments. At some point in time, a lot of you know, a lot of people saw secondhand clothing as demeaning to us as a people. And so you know, one would rather spend their money on creating clothes that is quality sewn by a family tailor or a tailor that is in the neighborhood and that will be handed down to siblings um, and relations so that was in, in, in my opinion is a form of resistance um, um, which we don't see today because now be we have normalized, it's been normalized. And so now it's very easy to say, oh, um, I have this brand name from the, from the West or the global North that puts me in the league of my peers out there. The question of um, what aspects of Ghanaian upcycling sustainability culture have been lost to secondhand markets like Katamanto. Hmm. Yeah. Fabric creation.
I, up until very recent, didn't buy fabrics made on this continent because it was cheaper to buy like some bed sheet or you know like a bed sheet that was like cool and create clothes out of than it was to go and buy woven fabric or cotton printed fabric from here so that then made it harder to like say okay i am going to give this hand me down to my sibling because it's cheap right you're buying t-shirts and it's cheap and you're buying you know cheap clothes and you know you you, you can't give it to your relation because it's not you know it's, it's not made by a tailor that everybody knows and respects and loves you know that practice is gone you know that abs like to that in itself i feel like you take that you could take you know something that your father wore and then decide to like switch it up and then you know you would also wear it you know you could take your father's black shoe and turn it to brown or brown shoe and turn it to black you know because it's like a you know nicely made sandals by somebody who you know who you knew because like for instance my father worked um um with a company that did their own um they built hotels so he was a carpenter right and they did their own up you know they imported their own leather to make upholsteries for their furniture furniture and he brought the pieces of leather took it to a shoemaker and then they created sandals and shoes for him i wore the sandals too but all this went away because you know i could just walk into Kathmandu and you know what i didn't cherish that anymore that was not cherished you know and so and so these are some of the things that we we, we, we sort of like um, lost um, to markets like Cantamanto. And again, it's not a black or white. That in itself has its problems, but we, we made something out of it because we, 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 were, we create and upcycle and, you know, use this, this secondhand clothes as materials to create new things. You get me? So it, it, it's it, it's a thing that one can say that it's positive, but also it comes at a very high cost. It's positivity at a high cost. And at, you know, how long can we continue to pay the cost for that? That then becomes the question. So let's look at what all this means for Contamanto today. What exactly is that cost today? So Contamanto is a massive, and today the retailer side of Contamanto is seven acres in size, and the importer side, right next to it, is about 15 acres. There are at least 5,000 registered stalls, and an estimated 30,000 people work here. There are, of course, people buying and selling, but there is also music playing, radios blaring, people dancing, people organizing around political views, folks educating over loudspeakers, people making things, cooking, cleaning. It is very much a community, and at times it's overwhelming, and at times it's the best party you've ever been to. Here's a bird's eye view of Contamanto so that you can appreciate just how massive it is. It actually doesn't fit in this image. 
Um, so clothing comes in bales to the port of Tema, which is about an hour's drive from Kansamanto. Each bale of clothing weighs 120 to 200 pounds. There are a minimum of 400 bales in one container. So at 100 containers a week, there are roughly 15 million items unloaded in this market every single week. The population of Ghana is just over 30 million people. In this picture, you can see that bales exported from all over the world are being sold by importers to retailers for anywhere from $75 to $500 a piece. Bales are valued based on two factors. One is the type of garments like men's suits or ladies' tops. And then two is the country of export. UK bales are the most expensive and are considered the highest quality, whereas American and Canadian bales, these bales are the cheapest because they tend to have the lowest quality garments and American and Canadian bales are more likely to come with outright trash, things like chip bags, bottles, and stuff like that. There are roughly 100 families who import most of the clothing coming into Consumanto. The cost of purchasing the container from a UK is around 40,000 USD. Even though the container is expensive, many importers do make good money, but importers are still at the service of exporters in the global north. Availability and quality depends 100% on what people in the global north are making, purchasing, and donating. Also, when importers get their final packing list, there will always be some waste on the container, whether that is in the form of large unsorted bales with literal trash mixed in them, or something like 10 bales of winter coats. Ghana is on the equator, so not that many people are selling winter coats in Kansamato. Again, waste is built into the business model. Bottom line, the global secondhand trade is very much supply driven. This is Abana. Abana is a retailer. She works six days a week, leaving her home around 5.30 in the morning and traveling an hour to get to Kansamato. Abana will always cut a new bale on retailer market days, which are Wednesdays and Saturdays. For Abana and most of these traders, buying these bales is an act of faith. When she buys a bale, she doesn't know if it will be good quality or not because the bales are compressed and covered in plastic and metal. For this reason, retailers call their business a gambling business. And Abana always prays before cutting her bales. When she cuts the bale open, she immediately begins sorting it into four piles. These piles are called selections. First selection, the highest quality, makes up only 18% of the average bale. Whereas third selection, the stuff that looks really worn but isn't falling apart, most of the stuff that we donate, that makes up an average of 40% or 46% of the average bale. Now retailers need to recoup between 70 to 90% of the cost of their bale from first selection alone. While there may be quite a bit of cash changing hands, Abena is lucky if she makes around $10 a week in profit. This is often not enough money to cover all of her expenses. You might be wondering who shops at Consumanto, who buys the clothing. In short, everyone across age, gender, and profession shops secondhand. The two main reasons are one, secondhand is cheap, and two, because there is massive variety. But even more important than who is shopping is the way that people shop. Ghanaian consumers have a very intimate relationship with fashion and look at clothing not as a commodity, but as a material to be reworked and upcycled. Consumanto is responsible for extending the life of far more garments than any resale platform in the United States. For comparison, ThreadUp's 2020 report states that they recirculated 100 million items in 10 years. Consumanto recirculates 100 million items every four months. Consumanto is also a model of sustainability because it is not simply a place to buy clothing. On the contrary, Consumanto is also a design studio and a factory all in one. There are tailors and seamstresses, screen printers, cobblers, a whole section of the market is dedicated to over dye. There are also people there to iron, mend, and wash clothing. There are also many local designers, such as Molly and our friends at the Slum Studio, Oteng, and The Revival, who work hand in hand with Consumanto Creative to promote upcycling culture beyond the bounds of Consumanto. Consumanto is the largest resale and upcycling economy in the world. This combination of consumer agency, hundreds of skilled tailors, and the resilience of the upcycling culture make this possible. This should be honored and supported, but it should not be romanticized. Because Consumanto sits at the end of fast fashion's oversupplied chain on the front lines of fashion's waste crisis, which brings us to waste colonialism. Despite the efforts of Consumanto's retailers, dyers, tailors, designers, and consumers, not all of the clothing can be sold. 
At the end of the day, our research found that 40% of the clothing flowing through Contamanto, about 6 million garments, will leave the market as waste, usually within a week of landing at port. Clothing waste from Contamanto is handled in two ways, formally by the government and informally by individuals. The local government, the AMA, picks up 70 tons of clothing waste from Contamanto every single day. This is the largest consolidated point of waste in all of Accra, and this is not gone as waste. The 70 tons of secondhand clothing was being dumped in Pone landfill. Pone was financed by the World Bank, and when they were making plans, they did not account for foreign waste products like secondhand clothing, which is a big problem because secondhand clothing from Contamanto alone represented 20% of the planned capacity of this landfill, which is much higher than in the United States where all textile waste represents under 8% of landfill. As a result, Pone filled up four years ahead of schedule and exploded in August, 2019. The site has been unusable since. In this video, you could see some of the hundreds of waste pickers scrambling to roll bags of recovered plastic and wire out of the fire's path and down the hill while they were breathing in noxious fumes. They were literally risking their lives to recover plastic bottles, bottles that would be exported to the global north where they are then made into recycled PEP textiles, which are then sold as quote unquote sustainable garments, all while releasing microfibers into our global water supply. A scenario that keeps the social and financial capital of the circular economy concentrated in the global north. Meanwhile, even before Pone exploded, most of Contamanto's clothing never went to landfill because the AMA does not have the budget or the trucks to transport all of the clothing waste that is generated each day. Some of this waste will be swept into the open gutter system where it absorbs all sorts of industrial and human excrement before being pushed out to sea. Once at sea, some of this clothing is washed up on beaches in the form of these tangled masses that we call tentacles. Once washed ashore, they will likely be burnt because there's no better option. Still, more will end up on the ocean floor where it will catch on fishermen's nets and leach microfibers and chemicals from dye. A few months ago, we met a fisherman who had almost capsized because the clothing was weighing down his net. There is still more clothing waste than goes landfill or the ocean. The remaining waste from Contamanto is dumped in informal settlements. This is a photo of a 50 foot dump that is over 60% clothing waste. If you attended my class or my last class with Slow Factory, you know that this dump was once 30 feet, but it has nearly doubled during the pandemic. And the only way to make room for more stuff is to burn what is already there. Every time I have been to the dump site, which is about 20 times between April and June, it has been on fire. This clothing dump is located in an informal settlement called Old Fatima, where roughly 80,000 people live, some of them working in Contamanto. This waste is in people's backyards, where children play, and where cattle graze. The waste clearly has a negative impact on a crowd's environment, but there are also social impacts. Our research shows that less than 20% of Contamanto's retailers make a profit. Over 40% do not make their money back and operate on credit. So yes, many people have created a job for themselves through Contamanto, but these are not necessarily good jobs. The business has always, or has become far too risky. The most absurd part of all is that the same brands that made the pay up list this year for canceling orders during the pandemic and are thus indebted to garment workers. These brands make up a bulk of the clothing that comes through Contamanto, where retailers are going into debt to buy it. One of the biggest misconceptions of the global secondhand trade is that exporting secondhand clothing is a net positive because it will stop fast fashion brands from coming to countries like Ghana and that this will force the fast fashion industry to stop overproducing. This makes no sense. Is there any proof that the abundance of secondhand clothing in the global north has slowed down production and consumption of new things? No, there is not. Excess secondhand clothing teaches people that clothing is a disposable commodity and it lowers the perceived value of fashion overall. It's really hard to convince people that clothing has value when they've grown up literally walking on top of it and brushing up against it while they swim. As Molly said, the things people buy in Contamanto are not things that get passed down within families. This primes people to become consumers of new fast fashion. Because excess secondhand clothing is slowly eroding indigenous sustainability logic, it also means that people are not supporting local designers. How can an emerging designer in Ghana compete with nearly free secondhand clothes? They can't. Local designers are forced to either water down their ideas 
to sell to, to sell things at a cheaper price, or they have to design for a foreign customer, which reinforces the colonial gaze and opens them up to cultural appropriation. All of this is good news for fast fashion brands that are interested in expanding their frontier. One of the most inch or one of the most essential roles in Consumanto is that of the Kaye, which means female headquarter. Consumanto's Kaye, some as young as eight, transport bales of clothing between importers and retailers, and they also transport some of the clothing waste. Each bale weighs 120 to 200 pounds, so this is their entire body weight, if not heavier. Often with their babies wrapped around their backs, these women transport bales all over the market, carefully weaving in and out as people shop. Traveling a mile or more, they are paid between 30 cents to $1 per trip. This is barely enough to cover their daily expenses. Most of these girls and women migrate from rural environments in Northern Ghana, the region that the British intentionally underdeveloped. Whether on a mission to save money for school, to send funds home, or to raise money to start a family, the challenges these women face as Taiye make it difficult for them to survive, let alone to transcend their situation. This labor is backbreaking. Many Taiye are injured when bales fall and break their limbs. Some die when their necks break under the weight of the bales. We work with Kaye through a variety of initiatives, and we recently launched a chiropractic research and treatment program with our partner, Dr. Dordor. In the first official week of this program, Chloe told me that there was a girl whose x-rays startled the team. This girl is 18, and the doctor said that she must stop working immediately or else she could be debilitated for life or worse. This is Old Fatima, where that 50-foot dump is located. Just two weeks ago, part of this community was demolished. In the name of sustainability, the government bulldozed people's homes and leveled their businesses, claiming that they were at fault for the waste that clogs the lagoon. But the waste is not the fault of this community. The waste comes from outside. The impacts of this demolition are multifold. Their homes destroyed. For the CAE we work with, this has meant an increase in sexual violence, and it means going to work to perform backbreaking labor after sleeping on the street. What's more, this demolition is supposed to make room for ecological regeneration projects where the government plans to plant trees and clear plastic from the water. This might sound positive, but A, there's no way that this is gonna work if the plan requires displacing 80,000 people, and B, if it were to work, the effort would not be in the service of the community that lives here. This is prime real estate in the heart of Accra. If it is ever cleaned up, it will be quote unquote developed and the communal structures and low waste lifestyles of the people who live here will be replaced with resource intensive structures and high waste lifestyles, but it will look cleaner. This is what waste colonialism looks like. Waste is blamed not on those who live a life of excess, but on those who figure out how to survive despite being dumped on. What Contamanto makes visible to us is that there is no market anywhere in the world capable of absorbing the sheer quantity of excess being produced by the fashion brands every single year. Yes, Contamanto is surviving and it's still doing all it can to resist disposability culture, but it's high time that the fashion industry stop using other people's resilience as their excuse to continue destroying cultures and ecosystems. And with that, I will hand it over to my friends, Nikiki and Bobby from Uganda to share their perspective from across the continent. Hi, I'm Mikisi Serumaga. I'm a multimedia storyteller based out of Kampala. I'm really interested in taking super dense and rich information and sharing it in accessible ways across documentary film, podcasts, and visual art. Uh, for the last three years, my area of focus has been textiles. How do they impact the lives that we're living? How are they creating and destroying industries and economy? My name is Bobby Kolade and I am a designer. I grew up wearing secondhand clothes in Kampala, but I studied and worked in the global north as a designer and have moved back to Kampala three years ago. I had a dream, well, I have a dream still of creating a streetwear brand using only Ugandan cotton. 
So I started following Bobby on his journey three years ago. And the more we got into the subject matter, first of all, the more we realized how big secondhand clothing was as an obstacle to his streetwear brand. And number two, we realized that we just had way too much research to be able to include in the film. So we started making a podcast called Vintage or Violence. When I lived in the global north, secondhand clothing was vintage. When I moved to the global south, I saw how secondhand clothing operated as violence. Is this influx of secondhand clothes really a fresh take on sustainability and upcycling, or is it actually upcycled colonialism? These are really some of the questions that are central in our podcast. I don't really think it's a question. I think it's really clear that this is upcycled colonialism, Nikisi. And <laughs> the reason is because when you think about secondhand clothes, you cannot not think about the extractive nature of colonialism and the wasteful lifestyles and the wasteful production, overproduction, overconsumption, and overdisposal of clothing in the global north. So everything is tied together. And we cannot think of clothing in richer countries without thinking of economies of poorer countries. For those of you who do not know, Uganda is in East Africa. We are a landlocked country, so we're surrounded by Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Re Democratic Republic of Congo, and South Sudan. And we do grow amazing organic, also organic cotton. And we're really special as a country because we used to be one of the biggest exporters of cotton in sub-Saharan Africa. Now we are the 10th largest importer of secondhand clothes in the world. We're competing with India, who has a billion people, whereas we have a population of 47 million. That is insane. And I, one of the central points where all of this secondhand clothing gravitates towards in Uganda is a Wino market. So Uganda, first of all, has an incredibly young population. 80% of our population is under 35. Many of them are employed in places like secondhand markets and a Wino market is the largest. 40,000 vendors, 10 football fields, and thousands of bales of clothes coming in and out every week. So during our podcast, uh, Vintage of Violence, we spoke to different people who operate within this market or people who source their goods from the market to sell elsewhere. It was really important for us to talk to people who are actually part of the industry because a lot of the time the rhetoric and the conversations are from intellectuals and from politicians, economists, but nobody really goes and talks to the people who operate these markets and finds out like, what, why are they in this industry? What are their dreams? What are their aspirations? Are they here as a choice? Are they really entrepreneurs or are they just surviving? One of the episodes that really stands out for me is called A Degree is an Expensive Receipt. It's episode number four, where we're talking to a secondhand clothing vendor in a very robust shopping arcade in the middle of Kampala. Um, she previously studied sociology and her own life experience challenges the notion that secondhand clothing is an industry that promotes job creation. Ugandans are not being entrepreneurs out of choice, right? This, this conversation around entrepreneurism is, I think it's outdated because we're just surviving. It's a means to survival by entering really easily accessible businesses such as secondhand clothing. So there's a really beautiful quote on the website of Slow Factory. I'm just gonna check my notes. Um, Everything you make returns to the earth as either food or poison. And I think for everybody in the global north, it's really important to think about what, where, where are the things you consume ending up? Because you are the ones who are consuming most on this planet and polluting this planet the most. So by donating secondhand clothes, I think rethink that. Are you giving us food or are you giving us poison? Secondhand clothing started out as donations, primarily from, you know, I suppose good intentions and missionary spaces. But since the 80s, this industry has changed from charity to commerce. In 2021, it is now a multi-billion dollar industry. And one has to ask themselves, 
why? And why is the global north so interested in maintaining us as dumping grounds for their secondhand clothing? This is really important to me as a designer, but I also feel for us as a nation because just by following the influx of secondhand clothes and understanding where they come from, why they get here, we, we see that it's a, it's a global picture, right? It's, it's a global phenomenon. And we're at a tipping point right now. We need to realize that there is a crisis in consumption. The wasteful cultures in the global north that originated in a colonial past of extracting materials from the global south, they really define what's going on in the world today. And we here in the global south, we have economic and social I'd say crisis and problems because of our past, because of colonialism and because of wasteful cultures in the global north. We also have to think about taking responsibility, right? Uh, a lot of the time when we talk about these things, it might sound as if we're sitting in poorer countries pointing fingers at people in the global north. Okay, fine. In 2015 and 2016, the East African community tried to implement a ban on secondhand clothing in the region in an attempt to boost local industry. It failed. Rwanda was the only country that managed to implement the ban. Uganda failed. Kenya failed. And all of this happened because of pressure we received from international markets, more especially America, America threatened to cancel the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which would prevent us as people in the global south from exporting goods to America at discounted tax rates. So when I talk about taking responsibility, we can't really do anything. It's not in our power. The power lies where the money is, which is in the global north. This conversation is really important for me as someone from the global south. When my mother was going to school and cotton in Uganda was prospering, there was also an incredibly high quality of life that she was able to engage. You would stay in Kampala instead of finding another country to run away to. When I grow up in Kampala and I'm wearing secondhand clothes and cotton is nowhere to be seen, I also see how drastically the quality of life has, has, has how drastically the quality of life has disintegrated in Kampala. So, Understanding textiles as a barometer of economic independence and potential growth is really important for me as an individual, and I'm really looking forward to sharing that story. I think I'd like to end by saying something from the perspective of a designer, how can we redesign our future? Because, you know, growing up in Kampala, a lot of the culture you're consuming, be it from music, fashion, film, it's all coming from the global north. So we need to redesign a future where we're not also copying the modes of production. We're not copying the types of factories that exist in the global north. We're not creating huge factories with meaningless work for people. We need to develop, design new structures based on things that are already working here in the country. We can't just keep copy pasting what's happening in the global north, because as you can all see, it's not working. It's not working for them. It's not working for us. And if you continue on this track, we're all going to die. It's very important for the global north to recognize that in order to make long lasting change, they'll have to center voices other than their own. You have to understand what happens before and after you buy the pair of trousers to be able to even think of making different decisions. Um, we are part of a group of people who are you know, giving space for other voices and our own to be heard. Um, and we're really keen to join and generate conversation around secondhand clothing. We'll be making, we are making a documentary film in conjunction with the podcast. If you'd like to keep talking and support, please feel free to get in touch with us at our handles and email address below. All right, the last section very quickly. So what now? What should we make of the boom in resale here in the Global North? If the Global North is going to say that buying used is about doing our part to clean up the mess we made, which is the messaging that we're all kind of seeing, then we better mean it. Buying used clothing instead of buying new is a great idea if you need to replenish your wardrobe. But I am concerned that in our search for a panacea, a way to absolve ourselves of the guilt we feel from past consumer behaviors, I'm afraid that a lot of us have blinders on when it comes to the resale space. 
The conversation about gentrification in thrift often misses the mark because it focuses on criticizing individuals instead of focusing on the fact that resale is being commercialized and that fast fashion brands are looking for new sources of profit. I look at policies like the fact that ThreadUp does not accept clothing purchased more than five years ago, and it feels like they are more interested in selling things people never wore than they are interested in extending the life of things that have actually been used. Will Contamanto be forced to continue to catch the things that the global north cannot profit from? If we make resale as convenient as buying new, and if brands trigger us to buy used at the same fast pace, then are we really solving the problem? H&M just announced that it is launching its own resale platform in Canada next month. Now, some of you might look at H&M's foray into resale and feel that they're taking responsibility. But making resale as easy as shopping new won't change anything unless we stop making new. And I don't see anyone putting a cap on production. Second, I don't think H&M is interested in making resale accessible. They are interested in controlling it. H&M wants you to give them your clothes to resell because they want to profit off of it. It's that simple. They want to create digital identities for your clothing so that they can virtually trigger you to give it back to them while also virtually triggering you to buy more clothing to complement or replace it. Third, when it comes to clothing production, big brands like H&M are the ones that have yet to pay the true cost. They've stuck all of us with the bill. So why should we be handing over our used stuff, our collective resources, and allowing them to make more money off of it? Why should we maintain their relevance? They have debts to pay. In Celine's class, she said that consumerism is a diplomatic strategy that stops rebellion, pacifies the masses, and creates a sense of self-control. I couldn't agree more. The question is, can resell help us to divest from consumerism, or is resell yet another consumerist distraction from the things that really matter? The good news is that we can choose. Because in a circular economy, we, all of you, are no longer consumers. We are also the producers. We own the resources, we own the means of production, we decide who to partner with to extend the life of our stuff. Secondhand is our collective supply chain. Secondhand is our collective economy. So what do we want? To answer that question, we will need to reckon with the fact that the Global North blew the budget on new clothing, and we did so in less than 100 years. We therefore have a responsibility to understand why we are addicted to new stuff, and we have to rethink the underlying assumptions of the linear economy. Convenience culture. Most consumers in the global north think that shopping should be easy, and we act as if convenience is a human right. It is not. And in fact, many studies show that our convenience culture is tied to depression because everything becomes a transaction instead of an interaction. Second is this idea that quality is defined by consistency, but where consistency has become synonymous with uniformity. When I worked in the fashion industry, retailers refused to sell upcycled garments because they felt that the quality was just too unpredictable. The consumer expects each garment on the rack to look exactly the same. This stems from conformity. At the root of our disposability culture is this belief that our stuff depreciates the minute that we touch it. This is a really depressing take on humanity, one that paints us as destructive. We may have done some damage, that's true, but we are also capable of care and regeneration. We are capable of adding value to the things that we use. We must shed this destructive view of ourselves and of one another and grow to love the imprints that each of us leaves on the garments we touch. Lastly, I think we need to rethink this idea that recycling is somehow superior to decomposition and decay. This is something I see playing out in the circularity space and it's very concerning to me. Look, waste makes visible our separation from nature. We are the only species that creates byproducts that are poisonous to us and to the ecosystems that we rely on. Focusing so much on recycling seems to further our separation with nature and continues to place us above nature and in control of nature but there seems to be this aesthetic fascination with recycling, this purity, futuristic vibe. The H&M Loop video really speaks to this aesthetic. But if we are going to clean up fashion's waste crisis, then we are going to need to fall in love with the aesthetics of decay and decomposition because our stuff will hit the environment at some point. We cannot juggle it above nature forever. It's so exhausting being above nature. 
Figuring out how to facilitate non-harmful decay and decomposition should be the goal. And for that, we will need to unlearn certain aesthetic hierarchies and embrace the messiness of decay and decomposition. Next, we can reframe excess as abundance. <laughs> there is more than enough clothing for everyone on the planet. This can be a great relief if we commit to taking responsibility for the stuff that already exists. This is also an opportunity to liberate our sense of demand and desire from the false sense of scarcity and the lack that the fashion industry has instilled in us. We do this by building an economy of abundance rooted in acts of solidarity, where each of us recognizes our relative privilege and redistributes what we do not need while trusting others to do the same. Can you give some of your time to volunteer with a charity where you donate your clothes? Can big clothing charities like Goodwill and secondhand exporters in the global north be more transparent and accountable to their supply chains? As an organization, we work in solidarity with the Consumento community. This looks like working alongside, not for Consumento. While we have many initiatives that are managed by our direct team, such as our work with CAIA and the lab that we're building, we also ensure that part of our organizational budget goes directly to people working in Consumento with us maintaining no control over how the money is spent. In addition, we have a secondhand solidarity fund where we direct speaking fees and donations in the form of crisis relief and debt relief for retailers and CAIA. These are some of the ways that we work towards reciprocity and solidarity within our community. It would be great to see more profit sharing within the resale space. Vestiaire Collective is already doing this, and I would love to see more follow their lead. We should also be asking how brands are using the money from clothing take back schemes and resale. The most unnatural thing about fashion is not its materials, it is the consolidation of wealth. For all of the talk about modeling circularity off of nature, I don't see any fast fashion billionaires trying to redistribute money in the way that mycelium redistributes nutrients. If brands are going to launch their own resale programs, then I would like to see them redistribute that money to garment workers or to build profit sharing into their relationship with manufacturers. If we are rooted in abundance, then there is no reason not to share. People often ask me for examples of circular brands. There aren't any, not because people aren't doing really good work. There are lots of people doing good work. Brands like Osai Duro, Sway So Shop, platforms like Vestier, and every upcycler we know in Ghana, they're doing incredible work. But it is impossible for a brand to be circular. The point of circularity is not for one brand to expand to be all things. The point of circularity is for each entity, each actor, to become a more effective and equitable partner within the circular system. That includes us. If Consumanto has taught me anything, it is that a true circular economy must be about more than the preservation of material. A true circular economy reminds us why we need one another. Lastly, we need accountability from big fashion. These brands, we all know who they are, have debts to pay and they have apologies to offer. Reparations should not be scary. Reparations are just part of a healing process. Accountability looks like ecological reparations to communities like Consumanto so that people can build a localized circular economy. Accountability looks like a living wage for garment workers and for everyone else. We simply will not come close to tackling fashion's based crisis if the majority of people working in fashion from factories in Bangladesh and LA the secondhand markets in Ghana and Uganda are indebted to the very system that is exploiting them. Accountability also looks like degrowth and reducing production by 80%. We only use about 20% of our closets, so 80% can go, especially with the rise of resale. Otherwise, resale will not replace new. And the last word will go to Mauli, who will tell us what solidarity looks like to him. Thank you. The global north is driven by capitalism in a way that is insane. Because of that, it's constantly trying, trying to find ways for people to consume. So, it throws the word innovation around to create more useless shit to dump on the world 
so that you know we can consume so in my opinion i think the people from the global north should start questioning the things that these big brands are presenting as innovation to their consumer-centered economies because other people will pay for it. The North cannot save the South and the South cannot continue to just like do their best with what they are handed. So it, 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 it's, un, it's not sustainable. It creates more problems. So we need to leave our tables and create a new table, one that can really hear when the global south is talking, can listen. and then cause the change to happen. That's what I think. All right, thank you all. Um, we can have some time for questions now. And please do follow us on Instagram. We haven't posted in a few months um, because we've been busy doing stuff, but um, we will be hosting several events in for secondhand September, focused on solidarity. So you can learn more there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Liz. Thank you so much. This was really, really informative, um, really uh, dense and good information. Um, I have a question coming in. Um, can we hear your opinions on how the fast fashion industry and in general convenience in fashion has impacted fashion as being um, seen as an, a form of art in Occidental countries, but not so much in other countries? Hmm, that's a good question. Before I answer that, because I actually would love to hear from Bobby, is it possible to pull up, um, or could, do they just need to unmute themselves? Nick, is he Bobby, Maui, if you're there? Hi, Liz. Yay. Hey. Hi. Hi. <laughs> It's a party now. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, um, Candace, would you mind um, repeating the question? Because I feel like both Molly and Bobby will have really good responses. Yeah, sure. Hey guys, thanks for joining us for the Q and A. Um, so, can we hear your opinions on how the fast fashion industry and, in general, convenience in fashion has impacted fashion as being seen as a form of art? in Occidental countries, but not so much in other countries. Wow. Um, Mauri, do, do you want to answer that? <laughs> I mean, um, we have done this uh, for a while now and, and we seem to have gone round and round trying to be the ones who are answering questions like this and to me like this entire presentation has shown um, we are surviving and and so whatever that survival is able to depict and show the rest of the world um, and how it's seen it's not um, it's not something that, because it's not something that we're super proud of, because it shouldn't. The problem shouldn't exist in the first place. It shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be a thing that exists to begin with. So, if 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 the best has been made out of it and it's seen as something to, you know, champion or 
anything like that. It, it still isn't something that to us, you know, I'd wanna even like um, continue to even have a, a say on or about at this point. I think to, to add on what you're saying, um, I feel like nowadays this idea of forms of art and culture and um, we need to, <laughs> We need to move away from just celebrating art because it's creating culture. Maybe the new form of art and the new form of culture is actually regenerative and coming up with solutions. Um, so it's more about can we find ways of enticing um, also younger generations to to create art and, and culture that's actually not destructive. So it's like, what is this whole thing of, yeah, but you know, we have to do it because it's it's artful, it's, it's, it's important for our culture. Mm. I don't know if it's destroying the planet, then it's outdated culture and it's not art anyway. So stop it, you know? Yeah. I love that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just snapped in my fingers. Yes, that is outdated if it's destroying the planet. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. I love that. Um, okay. Um, next question. I know uh, you mentioned Abena makes about $10 per week. This obviously seems far off uh, from what a living wage would be. Uh, what would be considered a thriving wage in a secondhand market? Ooh. Um, what would be, well, I think it would, de it would depend on who you ask. Um, but essentially we look at pay parity and that's how we structure our wages as a team. And it's basically, you need three dollars an hour um, in Ghana, <laughs> so ten dollars a week um, is far, far, far below that. Maoli, do you have an opinion on what you think a living wage would be? <laughs> See, we're we're such a this conversation we're having is mm, where we are now, we're all privileged. We can buy the entire internet that we're using, I'm using at the moment, costs more than $10 um, to be able to like be on this live. And I'm in a place of privilege. And so, and even that, I'm still also complaining um, about you know, the living wage in the economics of this thing in this country. So I'd say that it's never, it's at this point, we're not in control and it's never enough. Um, up until a lot of things are resolved, the number, there's no number that any of us would like pull out at the moment that would like really, um, be able to um it will be wishful thinking and of course it's it's good sometimes so that we can have this information um to be able to work with but to me it's it, I, I do not have any number that i feel like it's will work for anybody who is working there at the moment um Kantamanto specifically because it's not good it really isn't and and so no number, I can't throw any number um, to that very question at the moment. And it's also, it is being complicated because Accra itself is being gentrified. So it depends a lot on where people are living and if they're being forced to move from their family homes or not. Um, but as an organization, we do like reflect a lot of on this and especially talking to people about what is the amount of money that would move them out of their situation. Um, for instance, for a Kayo, we know that basically if we can invest a thousand dollars, that's enough um, to train her in a new job and to also allow her to save enough money to then move home if she wants to. Mm. It's a good question. Yeah, that's good. Um, Guys, there's so many good questions in here. We have room for one more. 
but we're going to save um, the other questions that uh, you guys have raised um, for the session next week. Um, so don't think that we're ignoring those it's just as far as like a time constraint. Uh, so I have one more question um, that hopefully it's another kind of wide spanning question, but um, hopefully we can have some time to answer it. Uh, do you think a reduction in fashion production could have any negative implications for creators and designers in the fashion industry? I do not. I believe that A, I mean, I used to teach in fashion programs. Um, I believe that fast fashion has consolidated the job to the point where there's less jobs available to fashion professionals than ever before. Um, I also think that when it comes to garment workers, when it comes to designers, there's so much work to be done to repair, to mend, to upcycle. Just because we're reducing the production of new things doesn't mean that we aren't upcycling everything that is currently here. And <laughs> to upcycle everything that is currently here is plenty of work for everyone. It just takes people being willing to pay for it. And the reason that brands want to skip over upcycling and want to go straight to recycling is because upcycling is higher skilled. You, it's, you can't just sew one garment over and over, or one seam over and over and over and over and over in a line if you're upcycling. And so it would mean that they would automatically have to pay more for those skills and it wouldn't be as sort of uniform as a production process, which is why they don't want to do it. Yeah, but the question is also which, which fashion industry, right? Are we talking about the fashion industry in the global north or the fashion industry in the global south? Because we haven't had a chance to develop our own creativity and our own industries here because you know we've been inundated with clothes from the global north. So if you're asking, will, will it have a net negative implications for people in global north? I don't think so. I think they'd be better off with fewer clothes and fewer tra you know, fewer, fewer goods coming in and out of their wardrobes. You know, I think I think all the celebrities would be better off without all of their merch brands that the world doesn't need, to be honest with you. So no, the world will be, will be better off without with a reduction in production, period. It's that simple. Period. Period. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, and on that note, I love it. I love the directness. I love, I feel like really motivated right now in a lot of ways. Um, Thank you all so much for these questions. We're going to hold on to the rest um, for um, the session next week, but I'm going to put in uh, an invitation to join um, our Slack channel. If you guys are not already in there, it's a way where you can continue to have conversations about what you learned today, uh, continue to exchange ideas and build and connect. Um, it's a really wonderful global network of over 3000 folks. So get on in there. Uh, we'd love to see what you guys are thinking. And we can also, uh, you know, maybe attempt to address some of these questions in there too, and like have some, some dialogue. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, what time is it right now in Ghana? Uh, 5 30. Oh, five there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, all right. Um, so Bobby's in Uganda. What time is it in Uganda? You're seven uh, uh coming to 8 30 right now okay okay um so thank you all for being here um i'm still on uh on eastern standard time so i have some energy but we appreciate you all um and we will see you all next week at our next uh open education event so thank you all for hopping in i know we had some folks here it's like 2 a.m on some of y'all's time and you still rock with us so we really appreciate you incredible thank, thank you all thank you so much thanks slow factory Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm.